Hello, and welcome back to our study of the book of Mark. Now we've come right to the center of the book. And for the last several stories, we've been seeing this pattern where uh, Jesus and his disciples would cross the lake and he would do something, then they would get back in the boat and go back across the lake. And, and while he was in the boat, he would teach them something. When they was on the land, he would do this miraculous thing. And uh, we see resistance from the Pharisees who want Jesus to give them a sign and do things their way, do it the way they want him to do it, right? Um, and, and throughout all of this, the disciples have been bumbling around trying to figure out what everything means. And, and meanwhile, there's this recurring theme of bread, right? Jesus multiplies some loaves of bread to feed 5,000 Jews. Uh, then there's a Greek Syrophoenician woman who is begging Jesus for the crumbs of the bread that fall from the table. Then he feeds 4,000 Gentiles with a few loaves of bread. He's warning the disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees. And, um, and then the disciples just don't get it, right? I mean, it, it said that when Jesus walked on the water, they are surprised because they didn't understand the miracle of the loaves. And so it's like, they're supposed to understand something. They're supposed to be getting something that they're not getting. And then Jesus chastises them saying, you are like people who have eyes but don't see and like ears but don't hear. And it's interesting that that statement is bookended, right, by Jesus healing a deaf man and Jesus healing a blind man. And we see that that blind man, his healing comes in stages. And now we're going to see vision coming to the disciples in stages. So we've seen all these uh, surrounding uh, images and patterns and that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples something. They're not getting it. And Mark is making a point with all of this. He's bringing it up in a crescendo to a climax. That's what we're going to come to today. We're coming to the climax of all of this section of what we've been doing. And this is the very middle of the book of Mark. And I think that's interesting because it's clear that Mark did this on purpose. He's brought us on a journey to this place where now something's going to happen that's going to change the rest of the book. And you'll notice now that in this story, they're no longer going back across the lake. Now they're on a journey together, walking down a road together with Jesus. And, uh, and that's symbolic too for what we're going to see today. There's something about that not that like they weren't really walking down, but it's symbolic in the sense that it attaches to what Jesus is going to talk about, about going the way he's going and going on the journey with him. So today let's read the passage. Um, and before I do, I'd like to ask you to like and subscribe to the channel to keep studying the Bible with me. So we're reading today, Mark chapter eight, verses 27 through nine, verse one. And it says this, it says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can give or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them 
when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. This is a watershed moment. The disciples have finally understood something very important. Earlier they had asked, who is this? When they saw Jesus do incredible things. And light has finally begun to dawn on them, just like the blind man who was beginning to see. Jesus asked, who do the people think I am? Well, the people think he's a prophet. Well, that's good. Some think he's John the Baptist. You remember that we read about Herod thought that. Uh, others think he's Elijah. Hey, Elijah's good. Elijah was a very important prophet. In fact, in Jewish thought, Elijah is the symbol of all the prophets. So what we see here is that the people think well of Jesus. They, they think there's something really authentic about Jesus and that he is someone who speaks to them for God. And so the people aren't that far off, really. They're, they're, they're on the right track. But Jesus needs them to go a step farther. And he goes to his disciples and he says, But who do you say that I am? Now, it's not a random question. Because all of these things he's been doing are about this. This is what they were supposed to understand. This is what the loaves are all about, that they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. And now he's coming to the point, Okay, guys, do you get it now? What's the answer to the question? What are you supposed to understand? Who do you say I am? And everything he has done and taught up to this point is supposed to lead them to the answer. And for once they get it right. They get it right. And Peter answers on behalf of the disciples. And he says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Notice that in the book of Mark, Mark leaves it there. See, in Matthew, Matthew adds more to it. You are the Christ, the Son of, son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, uh, because it's been given to you by God. Uh, all that. No, Mark just leaves it right there. You are the Messiah. Done. Um, but Matthew and Mark are writing to different audiences, and they have a different focus in their Gospels. And, um, and Mark is trying to make a specific point in his book, and he has crescendoed all of his story up to this point where now they've got it they made the uh they've made the connections they understand jesus is the messiah and all mark wants you to know they got it they figured out who he is they finally understood everything they've seen and seen and heard concludes with the declaration you are the messiah you are the christ they're finally in on the secret and it's interesting, right, that like any good secret, they need to keep it to themselves for now because it's not time for everybody to know. Jesus warns them, don't tell anybody. It's like, you got it right, but don't tell anybody. It's a secret. Well, why is it a secret? Well, this is dangerous information. I mean, it could get you killed, right? <laughs> it's going to bring opposition, but Jesus is actually concerned with another danger. Uh, he's in danger of being seen as the wrong kind of Messiah. And now that they're in on the secret, Jesus begins to talk to them plainly about what this means. And it isn't what they expect. They've been waiting for the Messiah to come, the heir to the throne of David, who would set Israel free. They're expecting a king on a white horse to come in and deliver them. But Jesus is not that kind of Messiah. And now, with this confession, Mark shifts his focus. The first half of the book was all about Jesus demonstrating who he is to his disciples so that they will recognize who this is. He is the Messiah. But now that they've gotten the message that he is the Messiah, the second half of the book of Mark focuses on what kind of Messiah he is. And he starts off by telling them right away, plainly, the Messiah will suffer many things. He will be rejected by leaders, by the powerful, by the religious teachers. He's not the kind of Messiah that you're expecting. He's not the kind of king that they want. And um, he will be so different from what they want that they're going to have him killed. 
But that's not the end. He will rise again after three days. This Messiah will conquer through his death. And Peter just can't accept this. What? Jesus is going to suffer. He's going to be rejected and he's going to die. Peter just can't accept it, right? So he takes Jesus aside and believe it or not, he rebukes Jesus for saying this. So imagine, imagine this for a minute rebuking Jesus because his ways aren't your ways. They aren't what you want or expect. You know, and actually maybe, maybe we should give Peter some credit here because he had the guts to actually do it, to actually take Jesus aside and be like, Jesus, man, what are you thinking? We, we do the same thing without the words though, because we, we reject the kind of Messiah Jesus is by our actions. We act like He's the king that's coming and he's going to conquer and want to take things by force. And in our actions, we don't act like we really believe that the Messiah conquers with a cross and not a sword. So I think we do the same thing as Peter sometimes. We just don't have the guts to say it to his face. And Peter did, right? But Jesus' answer is, get behind me, Satan. All right. This is hilarious, right? Because... Peter just made this great declaration, you're the Messiah. And, and like in the book of Matthew, everybody loves it. On the rock, I'll build my church and all that. And now it's, get behind me, Satan. Literally, from one moment to the next, he has switched sides. Because Jesus isn't the kind of Messiah that he thinks he's going to be. And he, he gets called Satan. Now, Satan means adversary. And G, and. Jesus isn't what he wants. And so Peter has now treated Jesus as an adversary. He has aligned himself with Satan and he's opposing Jesus's plan. So it, Peter recognized who Jesus is, but he's not on Jesus's side. He wants Jesus to do things his way. He's opposing Jesus. And you know, this is the natural state of humanity. And we see this because Jesus says, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You see, man's way is different from God's way. So Jesus drops the bomb on them. God's way is backwards to the world's way. It's upside down. If anyone is going to follow Jesus down God's path, there's only one way to go. And you must deny yourself and pick up your cross. Now in English, there's a saying. We say everyone has a cross to bear. But the saying is misguided because we use it to refer to problems that we have to deal with. For instance, you might call your annoying coworker your cross to bear. But this is not what Jesus means. Your cross to bear isn't having to deal with things that annoy you. No, when the Romans condemned someone to death on the cross, a horrible, shameful, painful death, they added insult to injury by making that person carry the cross that they had to be killed on, that they were going to be executed on. You had to carry your own cross that you were going to be tortured and executed on. It's shameful. You had to parade yourself in front of the people carrying a cross where they all saw, this is a condemned man. He is going to die. It's kind of like forcing them to dig their own grave. And this is certainly not something I want to do. I'm sure it's not something you want to do. So carrying your cross, denying yourself, these things are countercultural. They're counterintuitive. They make no sense, but neither do the results. Because whoever loses his life will save it. And what's more, the shame of carrying the cross is the greatest honor. If shame keeps you, from taking up the cross of Christ, Christ will be ashamed of you on the last day. But if you accept the shame of the cross, you will be honored on the last day. And Jesus ends with a statement that it's confused people for centuries. He says, I tell you the truth, some of you standing here, now remember, he's called the people to him now, so there's, there's a whole crowd of people. Some of you will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, this statement has caused problems for people for centuries because many associate this statement with the last day. But 
uh, and he did mention the last day. He said, when the Son comes in the glory of the Father and his holy angels. But he's also spent a whole lot of time, context, context clues, talking about something else. Uh, and if you look at Christian history, you'll see that the second and third generation of Christians after the disciples had died, they weren't bothered by this. They didn't look back at these passages and say Jesus was wrong. They saw it in a different context, and so clearly they did not interpret uh, this passage to mean that it was referring to the second coming of Jesus would happen before the death. So let's look at the context. What did Jesus mean? Well, look what he's just told them. He's told them that he will be rejected, he will be killed, and he will rise again. That if they lose their life, they will save it. Taking up your cross to die will result in life. Shame will be turned to honor. And this is the sign of the kingdom. That in taking up the cross and in dying in shame, we will be raised to honor and glory with Christ. That's the sign of the kingdom. And some of these disciples here saw it. Not everyone in the crowd. Not even all the disciples, right? Because uh, like Judas had turned away before Jesus was crucified and died. He betrayed Jesus. And so some of them were witnesses to what Jesus had done. They saw Jesus crucified and they saw him raised in honor by God. And in his resurrection, the kingdom of God has come in power. Not all of these people saw it, but some of them were able to witness exactly what Jesus was talking about. Jesus took up his cross in shame, but was raised in honor. The kingdom has come in power. What do we learn from all of this? Jesus is the Messiah, but he's not the kind of Messiah the world wants. He is the Messiah God wants. And God's way is backwards and upside down to our ways. But if we are going to join Jesus on his path, there only is one way, and it's the same path he took, and it's through a cross. God bless you.